Good morning. Good morning. Okay, quickly find at least three people to smile at. Go. Oh, I need one more person. <laughs> Welcome everyone to Williams. If you would, grab your bulletins. Um, and if you're visiting this morning, grab the little sheet of paper at the end of the pew and fill it out so we can have a record of your visit. And you'll just drop it into the golden offering plate when it comes your way. First, we have an announcement from the Crusaders. So there's something going down this week. Sounds pretty frightening. Heather, tell us about it. Okay, um, the first mistake I made was not buying any insurance and my yard has 15 flamingos in it. They got here Friday and uh, so I will be paying my 20 bucks to the Crusader Fun Fund uh, for the summer activities that we're going to be doing this summer. So I get to do, uh, relocate them tomorrow night. So. Um, <laughs> Um, anyway, you have until uh, the end of the service to buy you some insurance, 10, ten bucks, and uh, we'll keep them out of your yard. <laughs> the insurance policy, um, Rex has the insurance policy back there for a measly 10 bucks. You can, you can do that. Um, thank y'all uh, for playing this game with us. Um, it's go, it, this has been going on all summer. There's um, going to be two um, flocks of flamingos in the community at all times through the summer, so it'll be fun to see who's next. For an additional $5, you can choose the next uninsured victim. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, you know, just keep that in mind. That's, a, that's pretty cheap to, to pick somebody you want to get it next. But anyway, um, we, um, we appreciate your support of the Crusaders, of course, and it's a blessing to be with these kids. They're, um, they lighten my heart every time I'm around them. They're, um, they're, they have a kind of faith and um, look on life that I certainly can use very often and they care about this church they're continually um, praying for you and thinking of you and they have an incredible memory they they never forget someone that's struggling someone that's sick someone that has a um, just needs a, a hug pat on the back so look them up and um, just get to know them but anyway, it's going to be fun, and um, I told Chris that he cannot buy insurance, but he will not be the first, first victim because we, can't, we want to surprise him <laughs> when he least expects it. So anyway, um, thank y'all, and God bless, and have a wonderful Lord's Day. All right. Good that you have your bulletins open. Let's look together. There's a couple of things going on today. After the service this morning, if you have signed up planning to help with the mobile pantry, which is this Friday, you're going to have a short meeting in the choir room right behind us right after the service. There's another fundraiser going on for uh, us folks going to Texas. We go at the beginning of June. So on the 15th of May, we will have a Tacos for Texas meal after the morning service. It'll just be make your own tacos. And um, we would like for you to sign up. There should be forms on the tables, wherever you find a table, um, just so we can have an idea of how much to have prepared. And also, there will be um, a T-shirt sale going on. It'll be $15, and hopefully you saw the picture. There it is. Cool, I like that. There's a picture, um, it'll be $15, and you will need to find an orange form and fill that out, put your size on there. We'll get those ordered for you. 
and you have by the 4th of May, so get that done. And you can also see Carrie afterwards, she's going to have this form with her. Okay, don't forget Wednesday night supper at 5.30, it will be our last one uh, until, you know, summertime is over. And then, um, let's see, that will be at 5.30, and then at 6.30 we will have our usual gatherings for Bible study and devotion time, okay? And also, really quick, after church, if you would like to help with VBS this summer, you want to volunteer in any way, see me. I have something for you to fill out, okay? Now, I want you to look around for another five people that you didn't get to wink at or smile at earlier, and you're going to hug them, kiss them on the cheek, shake their hand, whatever you want to do. Five. <laughs> you can do this. Cross over. Go. Five. That was five people, right? Everybody met. Yeah. Well, good morning again. It is good to see you all as we've gathered here together for worship. I wanted to say just one little word uh, about the mobile pantry. I know there's a meeting for those who signed up. Just seeing the response for that has been very encouraging. I think we ran out of lines on one of the sign-up sheets. So uh, it's encouraging to see our response here for that, a very important ministry. I think we're going to see a lot of, of folks come, a lot of opportunities uh, to um, do one of the very most basic things that Christ calls us to do, and that's to feed the hungry. So uh, I'll just be praying about that. If you can't be here with us, pray for that. Pray we have a good turnout uh, and that things will go well. And again, if you signed up, just make sure to stick around uh, after church in the choir room. There'll be a meeting there. So um, as we come together this morning for a time of worship, let us begin this time together with a word of prayer. So let's pray together. Great and wonderful God, Lord, as we stand and sit in this place this morning, as we have gathered here with family, with friends, with people who for only a moment are strangers to us, Lord, we, we invite your presence among us. We know, Lord, that you were here before we ever came. And yet, Lord, you also came in here with us. We know, Lord, that you do not just stay here in this place. That you go out from it with us. But, Lord, in this time that we have set aside to worship you, may you make your presence among us known in a very real way. And, Lord, as we've gathered on this day, we, we know that in the days ahead, in this week, and some of us will look back on memories of a time of tragedy and sorrow. But Lord, we praise you that we are here today and are thankful that we have come this far and that you are still with us. So Lord, in this time of worship, God, help us to focus our hearts and minds on you. To lay aside whatever selfish, petty things we may bring in here with us. To lay aside the struggles we have and give them to you. And trust God that in this time, when we hear your voice and feel your presence, that we will be reminded and filled with the hope that comes only from you. So Holy Spirit, move in this place. Stir in our hearts, open our ears, our eyes, and our minds that we may receive what it is you have for us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
When he had gone out, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man has been glorified, and God has been glorified in him. If God has been glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and will glorify him at once. Little children, I am with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and as I said to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you should also love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. John 13, 31 through 35. Yeah, we see what all is going on in the world and the elections, and it just seems like a big, hot mess. But isn't it good to know that God has the whole thing in his hands? I love this song. You know it. You can stay seated. Let's sing. He's got the whole world in his hands. Let's sing it. He's got the whole world. says no matter what's going on we can always have sunshine in our soul today let's stand as we rejoice in singing this great old hymn of the church i love it everybody sing it you know this one there is sunshine in my soul does such a great job of getting you to smile and then you sing sunshine in my soul as if you're singing moon river <laughs> let's put a smile on our face as we think about this song okay there's gladness in my soul today sing it there is gladness in my soul today seated as the children make their way down.
are you guys doing this morning? Good. You sound a little bit tired. I need to wake up. I'm not tired. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so. Hey, hey Caroline. Can I sit by you? You can't sit by me. Look at these pennies. They're kind of dirty, aren't they? Mm -hmm. We should try to make them clean, shouldn't we? Mm -hmm. Okay, so. Okay, so let's see if we can make this clean and shiny. You gotta rub it really hard. And I'm not very strong, and you gotta get some elbow grease in it. <laughs> Look, guys, it's already getting shinier. See? So let's talk about a big word today. Have you guys ever heard the word salvation? Yes. Yeah? Do you know what it means? It means, well, I forgot what it means. You forgot? <laughs> well, salvation just means, it's like when Jesus takes your sin and he makes them clean, like this penny. See how it was dirty before and then now, since we kind of rubbed it up and shined it up a little bit, it's all clean now? Well, Jesus does that with us, but it's kind of better than pennies because instead of making our outsides clean, Jesus makes our insides clean first. Y'all understand? Y'all get it? <laughs> okay, y'all. Well, I'm going to give you guys each a shiny penny so that you guys can remember that Jesus makes us all clean, okay? And then we can spend forever in heaven with him. Isn't that awesome? Okay, guys. I'm going to give you all shiny pennies, and then you guys can go on to Children's Church. Can I have a penny? You can have a penny. We'll give your penny to Mommy, though. <laughs> They're cold. <laughs> Y'all are free to go. Smell vinegar. Yeah, let me clean the pennies with vinegar, and then we'll give hers to you. Are you guys ready to go? Thank you. Wait, y'all want to pray real quick? Okay, thank you. Pray real quick. I think that's what y'all are waiting on. Okay. Dear God, thank you so much for these kids, and thank you so much for making us clean like these pennies today. We always look for you for guidance, and thank you so much for just being you. We love you, dear God. Amen. <laughs> Two eighty nine, two eighty nine. I love this one. There shall be showers of blessings. Let's stand as we sing our offertory hymn this morning. We'll do the first and the last. Let's sing it. There shall be showers of to be here on this beautiful day today. Help us to always recognize the blessings like today that you send our way and to be cheerful givers as we return a portion of all the gifts you've given us. Help us to use these offerings to work together to touch the lives of others and to share your love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.
Amen. You may be seated. I have wonderful memories of this church. I was talking to the choir in the back when we were going over the song. I was 15 years old. Um, so that's probably, goodness, four or five years ago. And, um, hush. And I was uh, really getting into gospel music, quartet music. I didn't start listening to it until I was about 14 or so. And um, Harold Wallace was playing piano, wanted to start a, a quartet. So he asked me and Walter Ingram, who had the coolest hair on the planet, <laughs> and uh, himself and, and someone else, can't think of the, the fourth person. And so I stood here and sang in my first quartet. And this was the song that we sang, I'll Never Forget It. And I'll never forget the message in it either. It says, I've been changed, I've been newborn, and all of my life has been rearranged. And I hope you can say that this morning. Listen to the choir as they sing this great Mosey Lister song. Lord be with you. Now, some of you know, I used to, uh, once upon a time, was a mechanic. I say once upon a time because I'm not anymore. Don't ask me to do anything. Um, but 
I think we're going to have to replace the clutch on the piano and the organ. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they've been double clutching and just also wearing it out. And so, thank you all. Well, hopefully that's given you enough time to find Revelation chapter 21, or see it there on the screen, verses 1 through 6. <clears throat> then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them, they will be his peoples, and God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes, death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more, for the first things have passed away. And the one who was seated on the throne said, See, I am making all things new. And also he said, Write this, for these words are trustworthy and true. Then he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water as a gift from the spring of the water of life. May God add God's blessing to the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Lord, now may you speak to us through the words of Holy Scripture. May we hear your words not the words I put in the way. And may you free us, Lord, from whatever distracts us, whatever may catch our attention, whatever faults we may put in our own ways. May you speak over them and speak to us as we listen. As we listen for you who call us, and may we obey. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Well, there were about two dozen or so of us seated in the red upholstered seats in the modern designed auditorium with its concrete walls, dark wooden panels, and polished metal railings and accents. We occupied just the first few rows of the room that could easily hold several hundred, maybe a couple thousand. On the stage before us was a podium and a single chair to the left of it. Just above that chair was a screen and both the podium and the chair were facing a long L-shaped table. Most of us had taken the afternoon to board the metro and embark on a rather long stroll through the newer side of the city to the Vrije Universiteit Amsterdam, which translates to the Free or Independent University of Amsterdam. We were there to witness a PhD defense, or a promotion as they call it in the Dutch tradition. We sat in that awkwardly warm auditorium carrying on conversations about what's it going to be like when we do it? Uh, How long do you think it's going to take before we're here? Six, seven, eight years? Would Jesus come back before we get to defend our dissertations? How long do you think it'll take? Why do we got to be in this big room? And what are we going to do? Because that night we had class until nine in the evening. But all of a sudden through the back doors behind us in the auditorium, there proceeded to be about ten men and women all in black robes, lined with black felt and black felt hats. They were led by a woman carrying an odd-looking mace with clanging bits of metal, some of them keys attached to the top. And the rear of the parade was brought up by two men in the most formal tuxedos I'd ever seen with white bow ties and long tails. The woman with the mace was called the Pedal. She was sort of the MC for the proceeding. We were told that, that she was the official timekeeper that she was to make sure that this dissertation defense was to last exactly one hour. Sixty minutes, not a minute more, some of them not even a second more. And after the robed-clad academics took their seats, the tuxedoed candidate walked up to the podium while his friend sat in the chair next to him. We were later told that this is a tradition that actually carries over from when defenses were literal defenses. And the person sitting in the seat might have to get up because the candidate was knocked out from a punch from his defense counsel. Now, I took a little hope in this because I think I can take most of the Dutch people. I really do. 
But after giving a summary of his research, he fielded questions from the various professors and academics seated at the table, mostly about his research methodology, possible ethical issues in his reporting. And after what I'm sure felt like an eternity for him, my buddy Caleb sort of elbowed me and did like this. And over in the corner of the room came the Petal, the woman, carrying her mace. And she walked down the center of that auditorium, came right to the front, and then stopped and stared at the clock to the right of the stage. Then, as if she had some pent-up anger, some desire to just slam something down, she raised the mace up in the air and slammed it straight down. I just broke my bracelet. <laughs> my bad. Okay. And he just slammed it straight down. And then she shouted out, Ora est. She did just like that. Boom. Ora est. Which means, it's time, shut up. I think that's the translation from Dutch. And I remember the look on this guy's face. He was from England. And I remember when she said those two words, it was like all the color came back to his face. It was like he had been holding his breath just in one lung and for that whole hour. And when she announced that the hour was over, that the time was up, he could finally let all of that tension out of his chest. Later we were told that while the defense in the Dutch tradition is to be taken seriously and one could still not be promoted to PhD if you fail to make a good defense, that the ceremony was more formal akin to graduation. So one really just had to survive the hour to just make it through the 60 minutes and you'd be promoted to doctor of philosophy, PhD. Just survive the hour. Just hold on until the time is up. Hang on until it's all over. Like a point guard uh, on the leading team holding the ball in the final seconds of the championship game, just let the clock run out. Just hold it. Like the quarterback who takes a knee when their team is up by nine with 23 seconds to go. You don't have to do it. Just hold on. Let the clock run out. Let the end come like a doctoral candidate who's put in all the labor, all the research to earn for him or herself that coveted degree, just fill the air with words until your time is up. You know something? I'm afraid that's what a number of us who call ourselves Christians tend to do. I mean, seriously. Especially, especially when it comes to what we, we believe about the end. All caps, right? At the end of the credits. The end. How this whole thing is going to wind up when God slams the mace on the floor and shouts, Ora est! When we're just short, we're just sort of holding on. Holding half of our breath, hoping we've done enough of the right things and abstained from enough of the wrong things, that when the mace does fall, when the trumpet does sound, when the hour finally does come, we'll be able to uncross our hidden fingers and fully exhale. Because it'll all be over. All the bad stuff, all the people and things we don't like, all of it will finally go away. And we'll be given our reward. So all we have to do is hold on. Wait. Stick it out. Grit our teeth and bear it just a little while longer. Someone make the argument that this is what Jesus' revelation to John is really all about. That conquering is all about sticking it out to the end, not giving in to temptation, discomfort, and persecution. Some would say that the book of Revelation is sort of a warning, a, a letter written in order to scare us straight, to keep us focused on the end, a letter written in order to point believers' eyes forward towards the future and the great realization that all of this stuff is going to end anyhow. So just buckle down, sit tight, because we're all going to get through it. And I have to tell you, it's not a bad way to think about things, honestly. Really. To focus on the future, to trust that God will eventually put an end to all that's wrong with the world. I mean, isn't that the only way it can happen? I can't do it. You can't do it. It has to be God. But what? What if we've missed something? Really. What if we've missed something in our obsession with holding our breath? with just staring at the clock, with looking for signs? 
What if God isn't asking us to hang on until the end when God shows up with a sledgehammer and a sword? What if? What if God, God is already here among us? calling us to join in the redemptive work of transforming this world into God's perfect kingdom. What if God's calling us to do that instead of just holding our breath? Now, I know, I know, this passage we've read from Revelation is one with which many of you are at least a little familiar. You probably heard it read at funerals or or something like that. It's a passage you've heard more than once. And I also know that the book of Revelation comes with all sorts of baggage for folks. Baggage packed by preachers, by Sunday school lessons, science fiction novels, televangelists, big budget cinematic thrillers. But I want us us to listen to its words together again. Specifically, the words spoken by the loud voice from the throne in verses 3 and 4. It says there, See, the home of God is among mortals. God will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more. For the first things have passed away. And all of God's people said, Amen. That's a wonderful, that's a stirring passage. It is for me, anyway, to read that. It's a passage that ought to bring us hope, give us a sense of peace, about the future, about the certainty of God's coming, that this tent, the the dwelling, the home of God, isn't in some far-off place, but is among mortals. That God will dwell with us, that all of us will be God's people. (coughs) But it's that word, that little helper verb, and God will dwell with mortals. I think think that's where we, we sort of start to slip gears a bit when it comes to understanding the end, and maybe more importantly, the present, the now. Because you see, while these words from John's revelation of Jesus seem to suggest that God hasn't yet come down, that God is still up, that God is yet to come down and dwell among us mortal folks, there are other words of Scripture, other words from actually the same tradition, than what we call the Johannine tradition itself, that tell us that God has already built his house here among us, pitched his tent here among us. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the world, and the world came into being through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to what was his own, and his own people did not accept him, but to all who received him, Who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God who were born not of blood or of the will of the flesh or of the will of man, but of God. And then it says in the 14th verse of that prologue, the first chapter of the fourth gospel. And the word, Christ, became flesh and lived. It's the same word, tabernacled, dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory as of a father's only son full of grace and truth. Even outside of the John tradition, there's Matthew and his name for Jesus. Emmanuel, God with us. God is already among us. Christ is already among us. The Holy Spirit is already dwelling with us. So then what do we do? What do we make of these words from Revelation? We can say, well, well, that means that there's coming a day and God's way up there and he's going to drop down and come to us. But when John the Revelator records the words spoken by the loud voice from the throne, he's bearing witness to the fact that God has indeed made God's home among mortals. That God, God's self, is among us already. And God's presence, however, among us isn't isn't meant to be some secretive, undercover surveillance job wherein the Almighty sort of hides behind the invisible veil of immortality like Santa Claus watching us, like he's got helper gods at malls, right, watching us when we walk by, that our parents, people in our lives are somehow giving them a secret report. That isn't how it works. God isn't making notes about our every failure and triumph, waiting for the right time to peel back the cosmic curtain and go, I got you. 
to finally reveal God's full self to us. No, God's presence among us is as real as the air that we breathe and just as mysterious. God's presence among us is one that calls us into relationship with God. Not to say, well, God's there and I'm going to do my own thing and hope I don't make you mad. It is a call into relationship with God, into communion with the Almighty. God's very presence among us is a call to join with God in bringing about the fulfillment of the prophetic promises of God's kingdom. And that presence, when we feel it, when we know it's there, God's presence among us ought to inspire us to action, to take part in actually bringing about the words of revelation and putting an end to those things that bring pain, suffering, and injustice upon so many. God's presence among us ought to stir us to actively join with God in wiping away the tears from the eyes of those in our lives who mourn. And no, we may not bring an end to what causes the mourning, but we can be there to help wipe away the tears. We are called to be faithful, to bring an end to those things that cause our crying as we seek to put an end to just causing one another pain. God's presence among us, along with His words in verse 5 of our text, call us to be a part of God's inbreaking kingdom now. Does it, 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 God doesn't say, see, I, I'm going to make things new one day after it gets really, really bad and I just can't stand it anymore. That's not what He says. No, God says, that voice says, see, I am making all things new. The very grammar of these words points to the fact that God is actively making all things new even now. Even now. That the kingdom of God is breaking into this world even now. And we, you and me, all of us who call ourselves Christians, can join with God as God's presence is among us to bring about this kingdom where all things are new. Now, I think, I think here I ought to say that, that we can't do this on our own. I mean, because I, if I don't say it, I feel like some of you will, will kind of go away thinking, well, Chris thinks we can just fix everything. We don't need God. We'll just fix it ourselves. That's not what I'm saying. And maybe that goes without saying, as we witness a world where there's so many who think they've got all the answers, the quick fixes, the policies that will put our lives, our state, our country, our world back on the right path. And then we watch as they just create further divisions, as they spawn more vitriol among folks who would otherwise get along. We can't bring about God's kingdom on our own because, well, if we could, it wouldn't be God's kingdom. It'd be my kingdom. It'd be your kingdom. It wouldn't be God's. We can't do that. Sure, there are a lot of folks, I think, who, who would love to see their vision of God's kingdom come. A kingdom of folks who look, think, and act just like they do. A kingdom with a gate around it, with a fence, a wall built around it. But that's not God's kingdom. However, we may interpret this passage before us. One thing is certainly clear. You can talk about time, you can talk about when and where it's going to happen, but this is for sure in this passage. God. God is among the peoples of the earth bringing God's kingdom to reality. God is the main source of the action, the primary protagonist in producing perfection. But that doesn't mean, however, that we get to sit idly by, waiting for God to do it all so that we can get what's coming to us when it's all over. We're not called to just sit there on the sideline and watch God in action and go, can't wait for this to get over. We're called to do more. There's some words, some memories that we have in our lives that sort of burn themselves into our minds. Things that happen that, that you know, they, they've changed the trajectory of your life. Moments that, that laid the track that brought you to where you are now. And there's always one that I go back to, even though it may seem like a really small, maybe even insignificant memory now. But I was 13 years old. And it was a Friday or, or a Saturday night. Uh, and I know that because I was at my dad's house on the couch in the living room. It was a time when there were more people than bedrooms at Dad's, and since I was one of the only boys, I had to sleep on the couch when I came over on the weekends. And I remember my stepmom, I, I don't know if she just wanted to watch the Dick Van Dyke show without me asking questions about, you know, who is Dick Van Dyke, why is it in black and white, well, you know, that kind of stuff. Uh, I think she just wanted to get me out of the room, so she went outside where my dad was. 
where he was replacing the intake gasket on the 78 Cutlass Supreme that he and my stepmom drove. And I distinctly remember my, my stepmom asking him, Paul, why don't you let Christopher help you with that? And don't none of y'all call me Christopher, by the way. <laughs> Only a handful of you can, and you know who you are. Why don't you let him do that? And I remember, I remember to this day what my dad said. No, and I'll clean it up for church. No, he doesn't want to do any of this. He wouldn't be interested in this. He doesn't want to help me. Now, folks, hearing my dad say that sparked something in me. I got off the couch, put my shoes on, walked outside and stood by the fender and like, Daddy, I'm here to help. And his look on his face was stunned. And then he just pointed to a coffee can, had some oil in it, push rods, lifters, a cardboard box with the gaskets for the intake on it, said, bring those here. And I spent the rest of the night out there under the carport, in the dirt, handing my dad wrenches, holding the drop light, asking questions about how this worked, how that worked, trying my best to learn and help because I knew it wasn't going to be the last time. Now, did I do anything really? Did I fix the leak? Did I replace the intake gaskets? Did I really do anything that my dad couldn't do on his own? Of course not. But taking part in it, helping my dad to do it, it didn't change him, it didn't change that car, it changed me. That shaped me. And maybe that's what God's presence among us is actually all about. Maybe God invites us to bring about God's new kingdom, not because God needs our help, not because God can't do it without us, not because if we don't do it, we don't get to be a part of it, but maybe our joining with the presence of God among us is God is making all things new. Our cooperation with the ever-living, ever-moving, ever-loving Spirit of God in bringing about the reality of God's kingdom changes us. Maybe God calls us off the sidelines into the action because it changes us, it shapes us, prepares us for the coming kingdom. Prepares our hearts and minds for the wideness of God's grace and the kingdom of God when we get our hands just a little dirty with God's work. Perhaps we shouldn't simply be waiting for the hammer to fall the trumpet to sound, the buzzer to go off, the sky to rend open. Maybe, just maybe, God has already begun bringing about the fullness of His kingdom as God dwells among us even now. And maybe, maybe the new is already coming down. And Christ is calling our gaze upward to reach our hands upward, but not so we may long for something up there beyond the cloud but so we may long to dwell with God who is here already, living among us. That we may long to bring God's new kingdom down to us so we may all live in the presence of God together. Maybe the new coming down isn't just a new heaven, a new earth, and a new Jerusalem. Maybe, maybe the new that's coming down is a new you and a new me, transformed more and more into the likeness of Christ into the likeness of the one who calls us to leave more and more of ourself behind and to take on more and more of who he calls us to be. Maybe the new coming down is you. The you that God is calling you to be, even now, even here, among us. Let us pray together. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, giver of the Holy Spirit, who was, is, and is to come. As you are in our presence now, Lord, speak to us. Call us off the sideline. Call us away from a faith that simply tells us it's okay to sit and wait. Call us away from a faith causes us to think that all we have to do is point fingers and call out actions. Call us, Lord, to the faith that prepares our hearts for your kingdom, that prepares us for the fullness of your glory. Call us, Lord, and may we listen to a faith of action, a faith that brings about your kingdom 
even as you were making all things new, even now. Lord, make us new. Make us new in your Holy Spirit. Make us new in the reality of the cross and the good news of your gospel. Lord, may the new come down on us even now. Holy Spirit, stir in our presence. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Stand with us. Hymn number 330. Only trust him. As you go out from this place, may you listen to the voice of the God who is present among us even now, as that same God calls you to bring his kingdom on earth as it is in heaven, even now. Would you pray with me? Lord God, go with us from this place. May your spirit be indwelling in us, giving us the strength and the power to bring about your kingdom. Lord, to be agents of its fulfillment in this world as we look forward to your return. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.